it, it wasn't it wasn't really working um but it's it's working now i could see you were waiting before so i was trying to get on but it, it was just really weird yeah yeah it kept the screen kept changing and i was like wow maybe she's opening it oh no it's not <laughs> i'm going to still have internet to see you drum roll yeah Ah. Uh, so but, you're learning some things about your Venus now too, with the bounds. The with the yeah. with the bounds. Yeah. Oh yeah, the Venus at the end of Scorpio. Mm hmm. Wait, would that be would that be Saturn? Yes. There. Wow, that's interesting. Mm hmm. Mm. So tell me what you want to work on. What's going on? Um, well, I had this thing about the prenatal eclipse and I felt, I felt quite drawn to that. Um, and then I realized what I'd been doing was that I, I, I put, I put the moon. So when I remember doing the video from the galactic, um, you know, the level one, mm -hmm. I, I put in, in a mid Aquarius, I put the, what I thought was the major, eclipse when I was in the womb and I think I think that was the um what's it called the partial lunar eclipse okay but then the solar I realized that the actual the full solar eclipse was a completely different um placement mm -hmm. um so yeah so I was looking at at that and I wasn't sure whether that was because it's not as well the the partial solar partial lunar eclipse doesn't feel as relevant so it's not actually as as profound as the the solar there's just a really loud fly flying around the room so it's a bit weird but um <laughs> it's like a massive bumblebee just going around the room oh, good. it's bumblebee day yeah um so I had a feeling about this, this solar eclipse, the solar eclipse on the 22nd of July um, in 1990. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I, I feel at the moment, I like um, looking at Scorpio, looking at, it does feel like everything in my, I feel in a, in a weird tension where Libra Ascendant is really, and the Mars, and the North Node and with Aquarius, it's very out there and going and, and being a brain and being a communicator and being a, um, very present externally. I feel like there's so much um, in, internally in a very deep space that I, I don't, yeah, it's sort of this kind of this insecurity really of this what feels like kind of bipolar in a way where it's like a huge internal space and how to match and bring that together mm -hmm. um, it feels like feminine archetypes and um I, yeah kind of really drudged um old deep feminine things Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and then the the solar eclipse is um hugely cancerian so the 22nd of july um i can send i, I was going to send you a screenshot but i forgot i could actually send you a screenshot well no i forgot your solar eclipse at 29 degrees cancer so it was the last last bit of cancer which would have been yeah the tw the very last of july 22nd when the sun was still in cancer so i'll write that into your chart so that's connected to your chiron yeah keep going yeah so that sounds that feels like a kind of, <laughs> it feels like a um like my heart feels you know you know if you've been crying and then you feel a bit like <gasps> afterwards mm -hmm. it feels like that in my body like my chest and that's that's kind of the, the cancer of the chest it feels quite at the moment quite tight um i mean there's so many other things for that reason mm -hmm. but i think homing in on it those kind of feelings come through and 
Um, yeah, so with the Cancerian maternal, it's, you know, you said it's like the wound of the mother. I'm really, that's one of my things is the, do I feel nurtured? Do I feel safe and mothered? And I think um, that really brings it out. Um, which is interesting because I just got off the phone to my grandma, um, who I haven't spoken to in, in months, maybe maybe two months, about, I wanted to ask her about uh, cauliflowers and, and, and tomatoes because I'm planting, like transplanting the yeah. little things. And um, yeah, it just, it just feels like <laughs> I would love to dive deeper into understanding. I don't know, I don't really know what else to say. It just feels really painful in my body. Yeah. And when I look at that chart, there's so much in the first house. It's just like full of things. What do you mean there's so much in the first house? In the cancer, so in, in the chart for, um, I did the chart for the solar eclipse. Okay. Is that oh, the something? actual chart of the event? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was really, really heavy, and there was so much. I think it was um, Venus and Sun and the Moon, of course, in the ascendant, and there was just a lot, a lot there. But I'm not really sure how to work with the solid, the eclipses, prenatal eclipses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. Once we have that information, my brain works really quickly. And so my job as an astrologer is to be able to articulate what it is that I figured out like that, you know, and that's your job too, Emmeline. It's like, how do you get the depth of feeling inside of you articulated to your client? Mm -hmm. And you have the depth of feeling which comes from these type of aspects in your chart. So whatever you do, you started this whole conversation with like, how do you get the depth of the feminine that's inside her innate knowledge and so forth, her womb wisdom, and be able to make that accessible and, and known in the yang expression of the world and how to balance that by polarity. So mm -hmm. as an astrologer, this is the process. This is the very process that we have. Mm -hmm. Like when I look at a chart and, and what you just told me about the solar eclipse and actually the lunar eclipse, I think is just as important. I immediately know what this is in the feeling of my body. And then my job is how to translate that to you. And that's mm -hmm. what you'll do as an astrologer too. Like you'll pick up Donald Trump's chart and you'll immediately have like a complete body download of like what that means. Mm -hmm. Or you'll see the grand cross diagram and your whole body will go <laughs> tingle. Like I know what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the crux of your chart, isn't it? It's like yeah. you have the full feminine depth of knowledge. Mm. Yeah. And how, do you, how do you translate that? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's how you translate that. And then with the, yeah, and, and then it's, it feels like um, <laughs> going through the, the lands of all of the, that, that pain and that wound of... Um, yeah, it just, it feels like emotionally heavy, <laughs> heavy and, and um, fearful and um, unsure of its worth, unsure of its relevance. And it's quite like a, the sea is really big. <laughs> it's not even a buzz, it's not a bumblebee, it's like a fat black fly. <laughs> I'm just gonna see if I can shut the door so it doesn't come back. Okay, it's gone now. Um, yeah, 
yeah it's yeah i just i have this this impression of of feeling like um just stuck inside that it's kind of like um being really unsure of its worth self-worth um i keep coming back to venus in scorpio because that feels like that and then interesting with saturn because it's like you know earning the self-worth <laughs> rather than um knowing the innate value of what that's bringing up from a deep sort of precious um emotional resource um and so i've been looking at taurus a little bit because the balance just to highlight the balance in taurus and i realized that taurus is stable and earthy and reliable and every day you know gets on with its its expression and i think something i've i really struggle with is this intensity of 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 emotional change and intensity of of feeling like i'm in a deep well and not really knowing kind of how do i get out or why is no one noticing me <laughs> and all those kind of things of um how do i shine how do I feel the sunlight on my skin? Because it feels like uh, interwoven with um, with that. So yeah, so the tour, the, tour, the, the 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 Taurus aspect is really, um, I think, really helpful. But I do I do find that I need to be working and conscious in these deep esoteric um dark spaces you know like the sex trafficking interview that i shared and those topics i feel like weirdly like my liberation or my expression is interwoven with that because it's sort of it's it's allowing me to to bring parts of me that feel interwoven interwebbed with it um, um, yeah so there's, there's a sense of i don't have the right or the ease to express that or bring that forward into more than a young space um i'm not sure if, if that is purely because of the um what's it called when the second house and the fifth house and the twelfth house the you mean the the cadence the, the cadence, yeah, because they're not, they're, they're sort of not steam. Not, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let, so, you know, my process as a teacher is to let you say it and mm. make, make sure that you can really articulate it before mm. I say it. Mm. So that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And it's good for me to try and say it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I feel it and I feel a bit stupid when I'm saying it, but I think it's not that. It's just that I'm just not used to saying it. Yeah, it's not used to having someone who listens to me, you know, who hears me as you do, and, and it's it's accepted, you know, it's not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, here's what I, what what our practice is as astrologers, and the condition of your Venus, and the fact that Vesta sends an intercepting line from the eighth house of death. Vesta is sitting there at 22, intercepting your balsamic moon. Mm. And so last night or whenever it was that Anaya spoke about Nyx, to me, you're like Nyx. Your, your, your whole chart is like the utter nothingness that chaos comes out of that then the love of creation comes out of that chaos eros really get this emily your chart is like nyx the dark knight mm. 
And in the dark night, you hold all the possibilities of everything that could ever come. And in that dark night, all of those possibilities are held with love. And all the archetypes will form from the chaos that is spinning. The logos. Mm -hmm. And then the chaos just keeps spinning into these forms that form. And all of those forms are the actual love of creation that is like the girl from Calcutta who cannot be taken care of by her parents and is sold as a prostitute. And your job, I see it as a deep receptacle of that love of creation through its chaos process and back into the formless mix of night. But you're the deep well that will hold it all and listen and have the true care and compassion for everyone's experience. But the only way we can really get over these experiences is someone like you who can hold the deep well, you know, who can listen to the everybody's story from Donald Trump to a woman who's been sex trafficked and groomed since she was a child. So your chart and and the wound is the way. So the eclipse uh, at 29, cancer, is mm. the absolute last degree of the feminine wound. Mm. And that feminine wound ultimately is this. We gave birth to every bit of suffering that's here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's ultimately the mother wound. The mother wound is we gave birth to all the suffering. <laughs> That's mother wound. Yeah. When I was when I was um, in a relate in a serious relationship with someone when I was twenty, and I was thinking about what would happen in the future with this relationship, and I thought, well, I guess maybe we would have kids. And I. I just couldn't, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't. And I, I and, and, and now I, it doesn't feel the same way, but at the time it was very much like, I can't have a child or children because I don't want to inflict the same pain on them that I, not so much abusive, but I just mean, I don't want them to experience what, the, the life, yeah. <laughs> I don't want them to experience that. Um, that's it, Emmeline. And that really is also the fact that your lunar eclipse is in the center of the fifth house of, you know, because I noted that somebody um, responded to that, that she had seen the new children coming in and they had more of a rainbow aura and they had more sovereignty and that they may not be making these choices. And we're in this phase right now that is so hard to hold. We're really in the next chaos phase right now, where if we really can get the love of creation, that we as mothers are the womb that created Bill Gates, that created Donald Trump, that created every child who has been terribly abused, and the wound is so deep, but we've got to go back through that wound. And I, I see that as your role and whether you can really express it or it even needs to be expressed. Mm. I don't know, but 
but it's like mm -hmm. that is the what the work is and and venus is you know venus is lamenting right now only for people who are able to really hold that lament so not everybody is you know there's mostly it's just an a yang you know frustration thing with the, the structures are crumbling and so forth and so i see you as the person who can hold that and your pluto conjunct the moon is really that too it's like <laughs> just <laughs> the condition you know the condition every bit of your chart <laughs> is that condition of the mother yeah of the, of the dark night of the mother yeah and that the moon is not is then in isn't like enclosed by pluto and the balsamic phase of it finally being in its utter darkness you know your chart is so that <laughs> yeah i i um i think there is a more of a peace and a centering in that when I can let go of what I need to be. And I think part of the trend, the part of the conflict that I'm feeling is that I feel that I ought to be more outwards and present on that kind of space. Um, and I feel more of a, um, being a centeredness and a security in a really good way when I just think what if I just put away that responsibility what if I cut off my need to be so present or whatever and I allow myself to be hidden inside and I just you know maybe I will maybe I will write a book or something it doesn't matter but I trust that my relationship with other people will come through those hidden spaces instead and I feel like yeah that feels really good to me because it feels less like I'm trying to prove something. Um, and um, I just, yeah, I think I've, had, I've been really resisting that because I think it, I think there's an inherent trust of going into that balsamic energy, which is me. I went, I went for a walk last night in the dark I've not done that by myself for ages. And I just went out into the dark as it was getting darker and darker. And I absolutely loved it. And I just felt it was quiet. You could hear the breeze, the kind of midges and, and the trees. And it was just so good. And I felt in that space, I felt like this is who I am. This is who I am walking the land in the darkest of the darkest of the night yes. with yes. mother and I, and I started to have, you know, spontaneous imaginations about, you know, oh, I want to go back and I want to journal and I, I want to just be and, and smell spikenard and, <laughs> and just like hold that space. Um, wordlessness. I didn't speak to Johnny at all all evening when I got back because I just couldn't speak. I just had to be in that wordless place um, and then just go to sleep. Um, so I think that's funny because um, that's, you know, to, to really allow ourselves to be there, there's a letting go of, of fear of, of, oh no, you know, how will I pay the bills or things that don't even matter because they actually, they're fine. <laughs> there's, there, it's, um, but it's, yeah really allowing it does feel like I'm always letting go of structure I'm always I, I you know I go and do a kundalini yoga training and there I am again at the brink of something which is about to change and I just let it happen and yeah I, interesting yeah they go and, and the whole thing is just like coming out now and I'm like oh I was there on the last the final degree you know the last year of this thing and now it's all <laughs> that's find myself. yeah we should look at your ascendant um, a little bit too with the part of fortune there. And I'm going to have to work on like the fixed star and all of that because Kachina does that too, Emmeline. So there must be something about that ascendant degree. Like mm -hmm. she'll like literally every job and thing that she's ever done, 
she goes in and then closes the thing. Yeah. There is something that we will have to figure out about that eight degree Libra. That's also where my Uranus is. Mm -hmm. So that eight degree Libra is something about like closing down with about maybe with balance and equilibrium because it's Libra. Mm -hmm. And I'll work on the fixed stars there. But I do see your chart as the, the need for the goddess to, and maybe we should do a session on this because the more that you express yourself as that dark mother who's letting all of the suffering of humankind come back through her and they're all her children and let her heart be broken again and again and her womb be swollen with awareness of mm -hmm. all that she birthed. Yeah. You know, and, and what I do, my process and your process as an astrologer is to let you, br br it will break you open again and again. Like everybody's story, I mean, the suffering that people are suffering just breaks me open again and again. And um, that is your job, Emmeline. It's, and you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not like low on customers. You know why? <clears throat> I am like overwhelmed with the amount of people who want sessions because I am the astrologer who says, yes, tell me your darkness. Tell me your suffering. You don't have to make it light for me. Yeah. I can, it's like, you know, you can take it. And if you, if you break, you're okay with that because that in itself, you feel I'm okay. I'm working. <laughs> this is my being. This is my, you know, I'm oiled. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to, to be, to feel. I, I wrote the other day in my journal. I, I, I think I spent, I, I had 10 minutes where I felt really free because <laughs> I just felt like, oh, I feel fine. <laughs> I feel free. I feel like there's not an emotion that's bothering me right now <laughs> when I wrote it down. And then I wrote, but I want to feel, I, but it was funny. I immediately wrote, but I will, I want my sense of freedom and my whole vitality to be 100% dependent on the liberation of others. As in I want it to be my own, our unraveling to be the same. I really, really, really want that. It's like a part of my soul that it's just there and I can't, you know, I resist that. Um, yeah, what, what people need to know and, and you first have to know about yourself is, um, like, I'm not pretending to be light or happy ever. Like, if you look at a picture, look at a picture, any picture of me, all the way back to that one from 1999 in Taos that I shared. That was a beautiful picture. I'm not smiling. No, yeah. Mm. That's true. Because... Um, and that's why the Libra thing is that we are people pleasers. That's the poison actually of Libra is that, you know, it's ruled by Venus. And so we want to be happy and we want to make people happy. But the other side of Libra is, and we're going to, we're going to be here to balance the scale. So also tell me your suffering. Tell me the depth of your soul. Tell me how hard it hurts and that it has been hurting like this for 25 years and there's no relief in sight. Tell me, you know, tell me that. And our job is to be the witness to that without trying to fix it, actually. Yeah. 
and that was my sacred witness video is like there there has there has got to be somebody listening who is like yeah it's torture yeah without trying to make it bright you know um and particularly with what we've put away in our society is those people who want to tell about their torture like this woman was so brave to just tell about her torture but we've made it like don't tell me about your torture and because of that we're all complicit yeah which is exactly what she described in her video was the wetico how it how it's done mm. And I was going to message you about that. Like, maybe we should do a session on really explain how this is done. Mm. So from the earliest, we're supposed to be happy at our birthday party. We're supposed to be happy. And we're basically taught to disassociate from the time we're small children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then to be complicit, actually, in everyone else's torture because you're, you're supposed to be happy on Christmas. You're supposed to, you know, you're not supposed to be suicidal on Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, I, I, in, this, in my childhood, I, um, definitely on those days when I'm meant to be, I, I definitely have memories of not on purpose and not that it was conscious. It was, I was just not, we would go on holiday and my mom would be like, yeah, this is going to be an amazing holiday. We're going to really, it's going to really be worth it for the rest of our year kind of thing. I was not happy. I would be very um, digging my heels in like, no, I'm going to express the deepest of my emotions right now. Um, it's really inconvenient for you. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, it is funny that um, it, it, it's, it's felt a bit like a um, <laughs> not really sure what to do with it because I often find in in spaces that are being held when I'm present I will automatically feel the imbalance where there's not someone holding that space and there's so much of me that wants to sort of vindicate it and be quite spiky about it but I realize that that that's just they're wounded <laughs> that's because it feels rejected but I'm feeling I'm learning that I think if I hold it lovingly and nurture it rather than take on the wound of it. <laughs> Maybe that's the good way of doing it. Um, and lovingly hold it so other people can experience it and perceive it. And Johnny wants to say hi. Uh. <laughs> hi, Johnny. So good to see you. Good to see you. You look I well. We're doing great here. I love to see you like a wild man running up through the deep green path. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> I'd love to run around in the forest with you again. I miss you. Ah, I miss you too. I hope Claude's well as well. He's great. Uh, awesome. he, loves, he loves his dirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good lifestyle. Yeah. I'll lead you to your, your secret meeting. Could you take the fly with you? Yeah, I can. Where is he going? <laughs> I don't know if you can take him. This way. He's <laughs> very rude. He's, a, he's kind of like, the pit makes that dark kind of. <laughs> he's the fly from underneath Inanna's finger now, listening right now. Yeah, yeah, because he came in as we started. As we started. So it's, here's the thing, Emily, because you can feel so deeply what others feel and listen to the lament of the dark sister, it, it is super hard not to stay in that soup. Mm -hmm. And what you just expressed is like the crux of the dark mother, like how can she really meet Ereshkigal and really cry with her and belly ache with her and tr truly have compassion for those who are suffering and then be able to come back up without being stuck in the soup of suffering. 
That's the crux of it. Because what I find is going on right now is because people are not willing to be in the soup of suffering at all, mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. there is a massive anger and rage that is being expressed because we don't want to feel any more suffering. Mm -hmm. We just want to be liberated or, or whatever, escape from it. Yeah. <laughs> So there's the crux, and if we can really figure that out, like how to let that balance sink in, that's what I see as the Libra thing of this. The Libra thing is like it wants the balance to sink in without the spreading apart and the polarization of it. Yeah. And maybe we can't, maybe we really, maybe that right now it's not really possible for that. So then we have to just hold the fact that there may very well be something even more disastrous to come. And that's where it feels uneasy for the process right now. And the Venus um, retrograde, just like the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, you know, the, the planets are telling us how to do this, but so very few people can do this lament right now and meet the dark sister. So then what happens is another level of the abyss will have to come. Yeah. And I, I feel like you and I particularly like, oh my God, we're lining up ourselves for like another level of abyss because we didn't get it again. Well, I feel that. I don't feel like it's hit. No. I still feel, I don't, nah. <laughs> mm -mm. And I, to me, as a mother, uh, uh, holding that mother wound, and it's true for you too, it's like, w when you, just as an example of, we're reading through the newspaper and one huge column is on the rise of domestic violence in this area right now because you know people can't get out and you kind of just want to flip through that page and not read that page yeah. um and the other it, and that is where humanity is it's like they don't want to look at that page yeah and then what happens, the deeper abyss from that is one of Rose's friends just committed suicide two nights ago, a 17-year-old. Oh. And the deeper abyss of that is that, you know, because we were, and nothing wrong happened, so it's not like that, but because, again, we're not able to meet yeah. the suffering, mm. the suffering is going to get bigger. Yes, like you say about the wetter coat, it kind of expands until you can really notice it. And, and now, it, now what's happening is like, that child just gave this unbelievable gift of suffering to ping the calm of the water and say, no, 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 now look at the reverberation of this, every kid Every 17 year old, like Rose can't even get out of this now. You know, it's like now Rose is even more in the depth of this. And gosh, how much further are we going to have to go? Are we going to have to go that far? Are we going to have to really go that far? So there is this fear that's building right now and those of us who are super sensitive like you are of oh man <laughs> the depths the depths they're actually still coming and yet i want to be light i want to be bright i want to you know ooh boy yes yes um Mm. 
I guess part of what I'm realizing as you speak, I'm realizing the, the, the simplicity of holding that and not feeling like I need to rectify it. Just holding it as an observer. I'm here in this human body, in this space seat, like you say, and I'm here to experience this. Why don't I just do it and <laughs> enjoy it as I can do, but really allow myself to have a place to do that um, and not feel the need to correct it. That's, um, I guess, that's avoiding it in a way. Or, you know, and not correct it, nor makes it someone's fault. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And to, yeah. Um, I'm doing a, um, the lady who taught me yoga um, is doing a spiritual kind of, she's, it's called the path of light. <laughs> <laughs> which I was really uh, resistant to. No, path of light. <laughs> no light. <laughs> but I, um, I found myself enrolling in it and doing these, um, which is really contrary to what I was feeling. It's, it's a lot of uh, engaging with masters like Kuan Yin and Goddess and all these different things, which is interesting to to experience and to see mirrors of myself. And I kind of, I was sort of interested in, in whilst I did it, whilst I was doing it, thinking, how am I going to hold, do this when I have so much in me that wants to talk about <laughs> all the other stuff that isn't kind of in this more, it's quite transcendent. It's quite transcendent. It's on that axis of the transcendence point. I would say so I'm like how you know where does this fit why am I doing this what you know what am I doing here again kind of thing and then it feels like go and do this for the, you know as 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 a presence you go and be in this in this space and hold who I am in this space and so it's again it feels like that Scorpio mis mystery of I'm going in undercover it's going to be a <laughs> secret detective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be and it's really supportive and with meditative stuff, but I, I still feel like there's a part of it that, yeah. And so in the, in the sharing circle online, I, I ended up um, sharing about, um, I don't know what it was, something I was processing. Yeah. To do with the fear of persecution. I, I've been, really feeling this old thing of persecution like of just terror in in my body like absolute terror like I, just can i sit down at the computer and do my work and, and i have sort of images of someone coming into the house with a battle ram or something and it's not real but it feels like that that um oh it's yeah and in, in, intense and um get it every day <laughs> and um I shared that and it was really well received and the lady who's leading it is a really powerhouse of a woman and she really was holding that space as well and I'm like oh yeah amazing um but you could I could feel that it could have sort of brought a quietness and a deepness mm. Yeah. Oh, interesting mirror. It's interesting to see that part of me come there and let it allow it to flow. Um, and I think part of it is just I feel um, I don't realize that in a way I, I forget that's what I'm doing. I kind of negate it, or I don't. There's that kind of overlooking part of 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 who I am when I'm just ticking over, you know at my base self so I forget that's what I'm doing so I have you know I, it's like um, I wear myself out because I'm trying to do all these other things and I forget that I'm already doing <laughs> a huge emotional uh, awareness and um, yeah and, and again that that feels 
you know, the same thing that society is doing is outwardly doing things and 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 able to look behind the layers and you know so it's it's, it's things like um all these uh, revelations are coming out about uh, stuff going on under the surface and conspiracy stuff and i i find it funny because it's like i will have known this all along so it's funny that there's a whole movement around it because it's like well it's obvious i mean it's there um So, yeah. Well, let's talk about the um, agony and the ecstasy. There's two things that I'm hearing here. Kuan Yin experiences compassion, not because she's just like compassionate because she lives in the 5D reality and has a nice garden. Yeah. But Kuan Yin experiences compassion because the lotus seed grows from the muck. Yeah. And so Kuan Yin, if you put, I have a picture of Tara and then this demonic being. I have both. Mm. And the demonic, in the tantric practice, the black horrible thing is how Tara, is how Tara is so bright. Mm. Mm. And so when I, when I return from my elderly person who really is like lamenting, really lamenting, like she wants to commit suicide. She's really lamenting for five hours. And when I'm driving home from that, I'm like trying to, like get that lamenting off of me, you know, like, oh my gosh, and like I, yeah, I got like that level of lamenting, I just got to get that off of me. Um, and then I just keep going, why do I need to get that off of me? Why do I need to feel brighter? And then there's this place where I lay back and I look up at the sky and see the buds on the trees starting to expand. And yet I am laying in this agony that I've just had to leave this panicking elderly person who is like mm -hmm. clinging to me and sobbing as I leave. Mm -hmm. And there, the agony and the ecstasy of that is where God lives. Mm. God does not live in the light of the trees. God lives in the depth of the mm. suffering. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I have been. I used to meditate a lot on the Christ of all, the uh, Christ of, the Christ of wounds, <laughs> the wounds of Christ. And I've been going back there recently and um, just like, wow, you know. Just, and, the, and there are so many suffering. There's so many people suffering right now. You know, a neighbor had her husband die in, in the driveway on Monday. And Claude and I, all we could do was drive by and see her standing on the porch weeping. And the police were there and had opened his shirt and he was dead. We could tell he was blue. And uh, Claude and I just sat together going, oh my God, what would it be like to lose your beloved right now? And we just kept sinking into that. Sinking into that, like how you would still hear his voice how you would still hope to see him in your bed at night. Every level of that. Because that death and that suffering is where God lives. Mm. That is the whole metaphor of Christ. It is in the wound 
that God lives. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Have you seen the film Mary Magdalene? I don't think so, no. It's a beautiful film. I think it was 2018 through the lens of her. And she just sits with Jesus and listens to him. She just feels, she says how she feels and she asks him, how does it feel to know God? And he's like, no one's ever asked me that before. And then she, you know, it's really interesting. At the end, she's the only one who walks away with that seed because it was so hard, it's so easy to miss, but she it was, it's all, it's a beautiful depiction of her just sitting and feeling. And the guy who plays Jesus is um, Giacoan Phoenix. And do you know him, Giacoan Phoenix? No, but I think you mentioned his, it, it, like, astrology even, or something, how he was good yeah. for the world. Yeah. Yes, he played the Joker, and um, really well. I mean, he's played a lot of things different and his chart I think he's a Scorpio rising and he's got loads of cool stuff going on his name Phoenix and I just I feel like he uh, just like it's so weird because he, these roles like the like the role of the Joker you know like he was this crazy murdering person but he was he was an innocent wounded boy at the same time and and the same person played that who then played Jesus and I just find that really interesting it's the same thing you know it's the yes. yeah. there's no there's no like there's the the innocence and the purity in the dark um, confusion the mud all at once um, yeah. That's very Gemini. Mm. Yeah, it is, isn't it? That that is um, a good way to understand the node in Gemini in the Orion constellation. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah, true. Yeah. And where Venus stationed is the center of that, like how you could be this and this, and they all came from the wound of the mother that she would give birth to such suffering and that she would give birth to such light. And that we as women, particularly as women, carry into the world a child who may have such wounds that they die very young and they suffer a tortured life like I think of Mother Mary, mm. who knew who she was bringing in. Mm. Mm. And the depth of her soul to be able to bring in a child. Yeah. Mm. That's why I see Mother Mary as like visited by the angel and the angel likely told her and she likely knew that this child would live this type of life. And then, you know, we don't, we don't really have to make Jesus any more than everyone's life. I see every client I have is basically the same. Christ Chiron. 
Yes. <clears throat> you know, and how do we all become Mother Mary going, oh God, if I bring, I mean, Rose and I went around this yesterday for hours. I had to sit with her in her bed because her, her friend had died after having an abortion. Oh. Wow, that's so everything we've just been talking about. <laughs> Gosh. And so for, um, you know, and Rose, the night that, the, that this happened, Rose was with a friend whose mother was the paramedic who picked up her body. So they knew immediately that this child had been picked up by a paramedic who was the mother. And the, you know, the shock reverberation of that their friend had died, she had died for whatever complexities that she had recently had an abortion, that she had been recently forced to go into an all girls school because thought to be safe from having sex. I mean, every wound of the feminine was in this child. It was like she was the feminine Christ. You know, she was, she, she was outcast and severed from her community because she got pregnant. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, and so every girl now, this is like reverberating yeah. of being an outcast because you got pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And the, the layers of that is that the parents, you know, are not to be held in blame, but the the parents were trying to make it so that she would fit into society. Yeah, they had a good intention somewhere. Mm -hmm. My mom experienced that through being with um, well, I was born out of wedlock, but it was more before that. She was in a relationship with someone who I met by chance <laughs> later who she moved in with him in the same village, very back town kind of place where everyone knows everything and helped him. He was a widower, helped him to raise his kids, beautiful roles that she took in. He was her lover as well, but she was uh, excommunicated from her family. My mom, from her mom, particularly her mom excommunicated her. And, um, And her mum, I call Nana, which always reminds me of Inanna, <laughs> who goes down into the dark. And I look at my grandma and I see that, that she chose as a soul. She was born in cancer, so her son would be in cancer. And I see her born the same year as my father, actually, my grandma, very much taking on that role of, I'm going to play the role of what society says a woman should be. And if you don't do it, I'm going to persecute you because I can't allow myself to do it. And she's really played that role. And I've always got, I've always had a real tenderness between me and my grandma. Um, it's like, I understand, I understand what, I can see her soul, I guess, and that that there's a love there that's beyond that outer role. But my mom is still suffering in her torment about it. Um, she was like a she was a tomboy who wouldn't fit in. And I guess did everything wrong. So um, yeah, it's really interesting. 
feeling all those <laughs> feminine lineups, <laughs> mitochondrial lineups mm-hmm. in my DNA. Mm-hmm. I'm really thankful for it because it feels very like I can hold, I can really, I can connect to my mom and my grandma and I'm like, well, what do I want to do? Actually, I can choose to be, hold the space for both. <laughs> That's a mystery. Well, who is that? Um, yeah, I, I'm coming to mind as well is this womb scenario. Um, I find myself in a very weird place where I I go to a womb yoga class and a friend of mine who's into menstrual medicine post, she's a lady who's trained in it and very into cycle wisdom and, you know, and I really appreciate all of that, but I find myself in a weird place where I can't fit in the cycle (laughs) I feel like I'm uh, I've never really fitted in that cycle I've always in in my own time in my rhythm and in my bleed cycle they're not cycle they're kind of on a different dimension cycle I don't know quite how to explain what it is but it's never really been something that I can come under I think the whole moon, 28 day, 30 <laughs> Good. <laughs> I can't do it. But I find it really weird because even in these most, you know, wholesome spiritual circles of, of, of groundedness, even then there's this like, we must be in the cycle. And I remember, um, <laughs> I remember... <laughs> I, I remember back in, the, in my more Christian days, and I, this was more in the metaphysical space we were in, where I was, I was looking at the moon and I was on the kind of, oh, the moon is the seat of aliens, and I, I was like really anti the moon for a while. And, and so <laughs> it's really interesting going then back into that, the moon is now a beautiful lunar goddess, <laughs> but the moon... That isn't she's not I've just there's so much about the moon you know oh it's the new moon oh it's the full moon and I'm just like stop it with the moon like like it's important but it's really not that um sovereign over us um but yeah at the moment I'm just I feel the the, the changes in the cycles of you know the, the astrology of the, everything going on but I, I'm just not bleeding <laughs> And uh, I feel like that's part of a lament. Um, But there's no one talking about it. (laughs) I I think maybe you and I should do a video on the womb and that my womb, that the womb is like Nick's and you know when we first started was about like we created every bit of suffering of the Christ consciousness like like Mother Mary created we all created our child's suffering we create you know think of the mother who gave birth to that woman who spoke about being a sex trafficked at an early age think I mean I really think about her mother Mm. really think about her mother gosh you see one thing that woman has to really get within herself is that we are the bearer of every suffering. Hmm. And, and not to avoid that 
is to change that. Mm. Not that we need to change that, but that is where change happens. It is just like you not being necessarily attached to the moon as the breeder complex. I mean, mm. we don't, you know, we, we really have to get to this point where woman stops identifying herself as a breeder mm. because that is the old DNA pattern that then creates the suffering. Mm. It's repeating until you get to the point of being able to become aware of something, isn't it? Because it serves a purpose, but then once you're aware, you don't need to promulgate it. You can start to look at the karma or whatever you want to call it and then just... And I've had some sessions with um, women who have deep womb terror. And um, the, at night, they'll lay awake crying and crying with this deep womb terror. Because woman does, woman is the progenitor of all terror. Because we give birth. And we have to hold that as much as we hold, oh, the wonder of motherhood and the wonder of the moon cycle and the wonder of that. That's too much in the light. We really also have to hold, like I give birth to terror. I give birth to the suffering that my daughters have. Oh my gosh, my girls during this Venus retrograde are really hitting every quagmire possible. Mm -hmm. And it is so hard. I mean, on Kachina's birthday, I called her in the afternoon and I couldn't even speak. I just kept looking at her and crying. <laughs> we as mothers, we really, we give birth to torture that these children will go through. We really do. And if we don't realize that, we're just hooked into this breeder thing, that we're just breeders, like all the 150 million pigs, pregnant pigs that are being burned right now, they're all pregnant. And we are exactly the same as them, Emily. We are giving birth to things that will be held in razor wire fences. We are. We have to get with that. We cannot continue to be livestock held in the cycle of the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A word which resonated with me, I think it was yesterday, harvest. The word harvest, I just felt like... Um, I've been watching a film called Jupiter Rising, which is interesting, because Jupiter retrograding and... Um, and Jupiter in a fall, Jupiter <laughs> retrograding back to Pluto. Yeah, there's nothing good yeah, about Jupiter. No. <laughs> Jupiter. Oh my gosh. This character, her name is Jupiter in the film. And she goes to realize that the whole of the earth <laughs> is, is being used for harvest. Oh, definitely. <laughs> being used for harvest. Um, so that other people, other species, or that can can live longer lives, more luxurious lives, you know, at the expense of people suffering. And there's just so many levels of profundity in that story. Um, the only way we're going to get our sovereignty is if we really realize these things and take our sovereignty. In the midst of it, in the in the crooks. And that's why we're being pushed so hard by those forces like Elon Musk and, and others right now 
who want to take more of our sovereignty and just make us AI cyborg race. We're being pushed like, how much is it going to take humanity for you really to, to be sovereign? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, is, are we all going to have these little chips in our arms? Are we all going to be vaccinated? How much is it going to take for us to be sovereign? That's why the, you know, what is considered the dark is creator's mind trying to help us. Mm, yeah, it's a very safe help. Creator's mind is just going, well, let me put George Soros in charge, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the reason it, it like, literally, if you listen to that video by the woman who was part of the elites, that is happening to all of us. And we're complicit with it. Mm. And then we feel like we're part of the torture too, because we ate those pigs. Yeah. I mean, at every level, it is like she just explained the Wetico book. Yeah. And then we propagate it and we continue to do it. And then we make our children do it because everyone eats ham on Easter. You should be happy we're having ham on Easter. Mm. Well, I, I, I just, I just feel like the cycle, it's nothing to do with cycles that keep going round and round. I just see the break in the cycle, you know, like you, it's, well, when, when are we going to stop eating ham on whatever, like what, when, like, I don't understand why you would, why we would continue these things when there is, when I see that there's like a doorway, we have to go through this doorway into the, what if there is no cycle? Right. Well, that's why I think that the fear that's coming up right now is that humanity is going to have to actually hit the abyss before we actually can or extinct ourselves. We're really, we're really teetering on not being able to get it to the point that the abyss is an extinction. Mm. Yeah. And I think it with the inner with my inner compass. I when I watched that next, uh, what was that film, Planet of the Humans, that mm -hmm. one. When I watched that, I felt really alive <laughs> because I felt like, wow, you know, this is true, and I'm they're saying it how it is, and I love it when it's raw and there's no candy on it. It's like pure. And that's, I guess that's the chaos. Like, yes, because it's seen. Thank God it's seen. Like, someone sees it. Yeah, and you know, my friend um, Tracy Forrest, who sings, sings the CD with me. Yeah. Her, Tracy's partner um, makes documentaries on this type of stuff, too. And he made a documentary on the shutting down of the nuclear power plant here in Vermont. And it was truly a grassroots type of thing. But what that video doesn't say and really still needs to be said is that now the green energy movement is actually promoting nuclear, even more nuclear energy. The green energy movement, it truly is the wetico, actually. But they think they're doing right because they're putting up windmills and solar panels and it's not fossil fuels. And now we're going to even have more nuclear power plants. But what never is said is that each one of those nuclear power plants, when you close that down, like the Vermont Yankee one, it will take 250,000 years before that place is not radioactive. So we just put a radioactive substance that will be radioactive for 250,000 years. I mean, it, I, I mean, we're just like, we are splitting the atom. We are splitting the atom. There's nobody doing this to us. Mm -hmm. Nuclear fission is the splitting of atoms, which is life force. Yeah. We are doing it. 
Mm. And, and there's amount of the same of, you know, the womb being the pathway to, you know, bringing in children who are suffering terribly. We have to look at that. If we don't look at that, then it just continues because nobody really wants to read that page of the newspaper. They want to read the distracting page of the newspaper about how we shouldn't be wearing masks. Which to me is like, I no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm who, um, that is like the least of our concerns, people, whether we should be wearing a mask or not. We got nuclear power plants. <laughs> but see, the mask is a mask. <laughs> is a mask! <laughs> yeah. I had in, in school, I had a German teacher, my favorite teacher. He was German and a psychologist and an environmentalist. And he was really weird, but I loved him. And he would always talk about windmills and stuff, but he also talked about nuclear power. And he was really aware of the dangers of nuclear power. And, and a lot of my understanding of environment, it comes from him because he would just, we weren't even studying this, but he would just talk about it, you know. And... Um, Yeah, and there was something really dark and brooding about all of that. And he, he, would, he would turn to me because he was a psychologist. So he could see stuff. And he would say, do you realize, Emmeline, that you are a deep, deep lake with lots of murky waters right at the deepest of the bottom? And I'm like, what? <laughs> but I knew that inside of me. And um, it's like all of that is related. This environmental scenario I, I remember when mum thought that the local water mum is really um intuitive um she just hasn't had a lot of people who have encouraged her she she felt that the water pollution the water source was going to be polluted toxically by some kind of capitalist company so she bought loads of bottled water and tins of stuff and put them in the pantry so that we would be able to survive and I made fun of her but it turned out later that she was intuiting something that was actually happening. It wasn't happening to us, but it was happening to someone else, somewhere else. And they managed to get to it and they managed to prevent, but literally someone was about to poison the water. Um, and it was like, this was really real. So most of my childhood with mum, when I was old enough to really have a proper debate about stuff, was around what are we going to do about the environment? Because mum was making architectural charts about how we like solar panels and how you could fit them onto a house or all this kind of stuff how you how could you survive if you had to like it was really weird we would talk for years about about this yeah so now it all feels really relevant <laughs> now you kind of you forget about it and then it comes back round and um It's really interesting when we talk about technology and Elon Musk and particularly with the Gemini Air at the moment. That is, um, I really feel I have to go back into my childhood and go back into that garden, into that field and that oak tree. And if I remember what I was talking about and feeling and writing and imagining, then I feel like, oh, okay, I need to breathe from that space because that's an adult, that's un affected by what's coming through on this more um, ungrounded kind of ascension-y type thing um, that's coming through the social media and all this stuff. Like, um, I really feel that every day. How can I come back into that that space. Let's talk about your Aquarius um, lunar eclipse in the futuristic where you're 
North Node is also. Mm -hmm. So. Well, that, that feels like that. <laughs> yes. It's like so, bringing it forth. Yeah. Because it feels like, I, I, I always think of Einstein when I think of yeah. the <laughs> And your north node is where the Saturn-Jupiter handoff is going to happen. Oh, yeah. Blimey, yeah. So, right. So, so Saturn's going to move past Jupiter. And Jupiter's going to stay there a little longer. Well, well, Saturn is there now. So Saturn is there now, but Saturn's going to retrograde back mm. into Capricorn. And then on December 20th of 2020... Um, Saturn and Jupiter are going to conjoin at that zero degrees and minutes Aquarius where your north node is. So much of what you're talking about right now and you're able to hold is this handoff that is about to happen with Jupiter no longer being the ruler of the age, but Saturn being this very firm teacher who will restrict and limit us, but also make us responsible will be. And I, there's no, no doubt in my mind with all the rest that we've talked about, mm -hmm. that you would be someone who has the, the node at the degree of the kingmaker. So trust yourself in everything that's happening right now. Wow. One thing, and also your lunar eclipse is there at 1348, by the way, your north node is conjunct my IC, mm. where I come from. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That makes so much sense. And where you are going. So we're, we're, like a, we're like a crossover in a way. You and I are crossover all over the place. And your Venus is conjunct my Neptune, all kinds. Of, your Mercury is conjunct my Venus. I mean, everywhere you and I have those things. Mm. Your eclipse... Your eclipse is at my series of how I know how to do agriculture. So your lunar eclipse is at 1348, which is where my series is in Aquarius, of the futuristic type of agriculture. Mm. So I do think that that fifth house north node in lunar eclipse is what you are also coming into right now as the kingmaker. Um, one thing I have observed about Aquarius is this elderly woman that I has, have has her four major planets. She has the ruler of her ascendant. She has um, Sun, Venus, Jupiter, Mercury, and Athena. So a stellium in Aquarius. Mm. And one thing that people don't realize is that Aquarius cannot take Wi-Fi. Like the Wi-Fi that's on is killing her. She is dying of um, like electrical fire chronic disease. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Is, is that so she can feel it in her she can feel it. In her body? It's kind of like a heat, but it's like a burning feeling. It's a yeah. burning, radiating electrical fire that she cannot take. And I think what will happen is truly, I think that we're going to go back to pre-grid conditions in order to come into Aquarius. So there won't be solar panels, there won't be wind panels, there won't be hydroelectric, there won't be any of the fracking that's going on because that's polluting water for 10,000 years because that also is a process that requires enormous amounts of water to cool down fracking because it's a thing that's beating the earth. I do think that our destiny in Aquarius with your North Node there is actually going to potentially be the fact that, and I want to know, I mean, I don't have that much time left before I go and see Judy, but I want to know how our mitochondria is shifting right now so that all of these environmental pollutants like 5G and all the electrical stuff in the air is actually going to shift us to the point where we no longer can tolerate any of that. We can no toler tolerate cyanide. We can no more 
with cyanide is in the smog. We can no longer tolerate the glyphosates, which do the mass farming. Are we want you know fifty for full fifty percent of children are now born with autoimmune disease. Right, is that it's because it's too much? All this. Um... Oh, I see. Over hygienified. That and their cells are attacking themselves as if their life force is a toxin itself. Oh, I see. Mm. So I do think in order for humanity to even survive, all of this is going to be going down, every bit of it, which is part of the scariest abyss for people because, oh my gosh, we won't have telephones. And yet we're being gracefully shown right now through the quarantine. <laughs> you really, like I'm starting to not want to get into my car my heart so heavy sorry go ahead i actually emailed our insurance policy for the car yesterday and said can we cancel because <laughs> i'm not using the car and i didn't see the point of paying for it what's the point it's just a waste of money and i could use it on astrology <laughs> and it's like i did the same with zoom i had a, an account with zoom because i thought i might teach yoga online and i was just like i just don't enjoy it and i don't want to do that so I cancelled that and I read a chapter of my book this morning and it was about mobile phones and about a woman who was teaching her child how to be responsible with phones and how she realised it was siphoning his energy away from him so he couldn't engage with his imagination and his play. Um, and he was writing poetry and when he got a phone, he, he then wasn't able to do it anymore. It was like that. I'm like, oh, I know that. Because I, I know what that feels like. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, I think, I think um, you know how we have like stages and processes of things. So I can cope with this amount of Wi-Fi. Okay, I'm going to turn it off at night. That makes a difference. And then, you know, a few months later, that's not enough. I need to be away from Wi-Fi in the day as well. And then it's like, I, I, I bought... This necklace, which is a really good EMF, it's got a crystal in it actually. It's got a really good EMF um, detector in it a few months ago. So I thought I need something else. But I just know that it's all going towards, okay, I've got that. Now I need to move house <laughs> because we can't be in a place where there's like 10 million Wi Fi. If I look on my Wi Fi on my phone, there's like at least 10 local Wi-Fi's emitting. Um, so I know that's where I'm going because I can't get up in the morning and feel that burn in my feet every day. It's really annoying, really frustrating. Um, and actually I kept forgetting, but I wanted to make that duvet cover that you recommended. So, <laughs> when you watch this video again see if you want to publish it on your youtube it's a good idea it's a good way of sharing <laughs> it was very you know private to you but the thing is i mean we just covered the crux of the womb and the darkness of the feminine that needs to be held during this Venus retrograde. We really, we got into that, like, why is the womb the breeder of all of this sadness and suffering? Yeah. Even, even I feel my womb saying, I don't want to, come back in I don't want to continue in the way that it's been and I will not and I shall not yeah and I, I, I've said no this is it mm, this is my last time we're either doing it or I'm not coming back again and we really have to get to the depth of this 
We really must. I think that Mars, Ceres, and Medea are conjunct in the sky right now also. Yeah. Yes, I noticed that the other day. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mars is adding the punctuation to the great goddess having to make a terrible decision for her children. And Mars is really like, <laughs> gonna, when it, Mars is like trying to show this very gently in Pisces, but when it moves into Aries, you know, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Well, um, I realized this morning I was meditating outside and I was focusing on my root. And I realized all this when I was focusing there, all of this fear of my legs were hurting and then, uh, you know, and then I thought, well, what am I doing? I'm warring against this right now because I'm trying to control it. But what if I just like i feel like you know how do i do how do i feel about that and um and then i realized that i've been judging this energy of go do be create exist i am be sovereign i've been judging it as being too forthright too um yeah, too hot-headed, whatever, what, just what, any, any, anything like that. But, but I realized that's the kind of essence that we need, like with, with maturity and wisdom, we need to ride that wild horse of Mars <laughs> going into Aries and, and harness that for our stability and our rooting. Enjoy the deep dark um, of Venus retrograde in the lament right now, because when Mars enters Aries, it's going to be like we all just put a turbocharger on the direction of potential chaos. So like right now, Mars is in Pisces going, okay, you know, just revisit and merge with these more subtle topics. Because boy, when Mars gets into Aries, get ready for everyone's car, everyone's unit to go into hyperspeed towards potential chaos. So the go button is going to be like on hyperspeed turbocharge. Wow. Okay. So enjoy the dark feminine right now while she's here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah she's very here <laughs> yeah. every day she's like I don't even know what to do I, I just sit in it and I just do everything really slowly be outside and I just I, I had this thing the other day when I thought that next week and I thought I can't actually imagine what next week is going to be like I have no no it was very very weird in my head it was like a kind of I literally cannot foresee what next week is and it felt in a prophetic sense there's like a whole unraveling and appealing back to this really deep space and um yeah Next week, Venus will make her star point. Well, let's you and I talk about your Venus star point sometime too, but I have to go and take care of my elder now, so. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. So good to see you. Yeah. All right, I love you. Love you too. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.